First up, we have Uma from Sussing Labs, who will be speaking about Sussing's cross-chain messaging and state queries. Hello, my name is Uma, and yeah, I'm talking about uh, Sussing's telepathy protocol, messaging, and state queries. So, just some background on Sussing. Uh, we're basically interested in exploring the rich ZK protocol design space beyond just the current two flavors of prominent ZK protocols, Z which are ZK EVMs and privacy preserving protocols like Tornado Cash. Uh, we think their ZK is this like really powerful tool uh, that has kind of promised to scale blockchains and like supercharge them in a bunch of rich, interesting ways. And we're exploring this question mark, which is, are there other stuff with ZK you can do beyond ZK EVMs or things like Tornado Cash? So, we thought a lot about this problem, and we realized that one area that ZK is currently underutilized for is for interoperability. So over the past year, we've been working on this concept of ZK-like clients, which is basically verifying consensus in a ZK circuit. And at a high level, ZK lets you basically compress computation, which is why it's really useful for scaling blockchains and used in things like ZK EVMs. But we also realized you can take those same scaling properties and apply them to verifying consensus. And this is useful because say you have a source chain like Ethereum who has consensus, you can verify the consensus of Ethereum in a ZK snark circuit, and then you can verify it in the execution layer of another target chain, such as Gnosis chain or really any other Alt L1. And then you can have this target chain basically have access to Ethereum state natively without the need for any multi-sigs or trusted operators in the middle. If you guys are familiar with the current state of bridging protocols today, many of them do the same sort of get Ethereum state on another chain, but it relies on a small group of trusted actors in a multi-sig to sign off and attest to the Ethereum state and then have that available on the other chain. What we're doing is we're just letting this other chain directly verify Ethereum's consensus uh, natively and do that in a very efficient way by verifying a ZK proof. And so we have this succinct ZK light client running on other chains that's really gas efficient to run and really cheap to verify. And with that, we can have chains talk natively to each other. So more concretely, there's this concept of the ZK light client that I just introduced. Uh, but concretely, what we built is we built a ZK snark that lets you verify Ethereum's light client protocol. And in particular, our snark enables the verification of Ethereum's consensus for around 300k gas on EVM chains. And how it actually works is you have Ethereum consensus, which as it's going through its process, it's generating blocks, it's generating an aggregate BLS signature of all the validators, and it also has this current validator set who are the people who have staked. And then we take all of those outputs from Ethereum consensus, we put them into our ZK prover, which generates a ZK proof. And in particular, the statement it's proving is it proves that a block header has enough signatures from the current validator set. So the ZK prover spits out a proof, it spits out a block header, and it spits out the number of signatures. And we take all that stuff, we put it on a smart contract that's a light client on chain. And then our light client on chain can verify the proof and then keep track of the headers of Ethereum. So our first protocol, Telepathy, is currently live on mainnet. It's been live since March. Uh, and it uses our Ethereum ZK-like client. And with this, you can do a few things. So the first thing you can do is you can send messages from Ethereum to any chain that has our light client running on it. So in particular, what this kind of means is that we'll have our light client running on any other chain you can think of. Uh, it has access to Ethereum's block header because it's verifying Ethereum's light client protocol. And then with that Ethereum block header, you can verify whether or not a message was sent on Ethereum. So you can, using this primitive, you can send messages from Ethereum to other places. Uh, this is really useful for protocols like, for example, Compound, which recently gave us a grant to do cross-chain governance. Because Compound's governance is conducted on Ethereum because of their comp token, which lives there. But they often have deployments across many other chains, like Polygon or Avalanche. And they want to control the parameters of their deployment on those other chains. But the votes happen on Ethereum L1. So it's really useful to be able to send messages from Ethereum to other chains without the need for some trusted multi-sig in the middle, as that would kind of defeat like, the whole point of governance. And then also what our protocol lets you do is it lets you 
also have access to Ethereum's consensus layer and the execution layer. So because we're running this Ethereum ZK Lite client, we actually not only have access to Ethereum's block headers, we actually have access to Ethereum's beacon chain, which is its consensus layer's headers. And that beacon chain state commitment has a lot of very useful information, such as whether a, valid whether a validator was slashed or not, or validator balances. And that sort of information is really useful for protocols that need access to consensus layer data in the execution layer, such as liquid staking protocols or restaking protocols. And so we're working with the Eigenlayer team, as an example, who runs a restaking protocol, uh, because they need to operate their protocol information about the validator balances and the validator state and withdrawal credentials. So all of this is done with the security of Ethereum's like client protocol, which is really nice for all our users because they don't have to trust us. They don't have to trust any multisig. They're kind of just verifying natively Ethereum's like client protocol and then getting access to this information. And then we're also being used live in production by Gnosis Chain, which is an all L1, to secure their bridge from Ethereum to Gnosis. Uh, we're being used by Across, uh, which is a liquidity layer, uh, which uses us to pass meshes, messages from Ethereum to other L1s like Avalanche. Uh, and yeah, there's a few other people who are using this arbitrary message passing from Ethereum and the consensus oracle in similar ways. So this is just a code example of how to use our protocol. I want to highlight, like, this is an entire cross-chain counter, so it's very, very simple. Uh, basically, you can see that you have a source counter uh, that has this send function, and you just specify, hey, what chain do I want to send it to? The destination chain ID. You specify what address you want, and you specify some bytes. And then on the other side, you just have to implement in your smart contract handle telepathy, and you basically verify where it's coming from, and then you receive the data. And this is really nice because it's really easy to integrate and pass these messages. It's very similar to a lot of other message passing protocols. And then this is an example of the consensus layer. So again, I mentioned that a few people use the consensus oracle we have to basically read validator balances or validator status or things like validator withdrawal credentials. And so this one is a, like, a little more complicated because the validator information is more complicated. Uh, it's not just simple bytes. You have to prove different fields. But this is an example of someone using us to get the beacon validator balance for a particular validator using our light client. OK, and then now I want to introduce our new protocol, uh, telepathy state queries. Uh, so it's not yet ZK based, but we think it provides some like, pretty interesting new functionality uh, beyond just messaging. So for some context, cross-chain messaging is a very push-based uh, system, interoperability system. So it really has this paradigm where I have a message on a source chain, and then as a user, I have to push it to a the message and information to a destination chain. So in that way, the user or the DAP developer is responsible for pushing data from a given source to a destination. However, we realized a few of our early users actually didn't want to push information. They more wanted to pull this information from other chains just in time. So in particular, oftentimes, the workflow that they would prefer is that, say, they have some function of their DAP that's on some other chain. And then you want to be able to reference some data from Ethereum or any other chain throughout the course of that function call. Uh, and that data might be kind of arbitrary. It might depend on like the message.sender of who's calling that function. And that was the inspiration behind our state query protocol. So at the high level, state queries allow users to call view functions on other chains during the course of executing on a given chain. So some example use cases, uh, that was pretty high level, but going through some examples of like what, why people actually want this. So one really common one that came up was that users want to conduct, or users, which are DAP developers, want to conduct, for example, voting on L2, where it's much cheaper than L1. So you might want your users to conduct some governance vote or some other vote on L2, where it's super cheap. But maybe you want to gate that voting by the user's balance on L1. So you might want to conduct some sort of governance vote, but weighted by some token-weighted voting where the token lives on L1. 
or perhaps the NFT lives on L1. So for ex as a very concrete example, NounsDAO is this NFT that lives on L1. They have a very active community, but often voting costs like $20, and they are looking into how to do voting on L2, but of course the nouns live on L1, so they have to understand the user's noun balance on L1. Another use case uh, some of our users wanted is Chainlink oracles ge generally post to L1, but Chainlink is not deployed everywhere uh, on all the L2s that they might want to deploy their DeFi protocols on. And so a use case people wanted us to do was say, I have a DeFi protocol on L2, but I want to read the Chainlink oracle from L1. And that's kind of another good use for state queries. Uh, similarly, say you have this perp protocol on L2, but it's on assets that are trading on an L1 AMM or on AMMs on a bunch of different chains. Uh, this is like another great use case of why you might want to read information from other chains. And the last use case I have here concretely is pretty similar to the first one, where maybe you're claiming some sort of reward on L2. Maybe your re reward is small, so it doesn't make sense to pay L1 gas, but maybe the reward is gated by some L1 information or state. So our state query protocol, here's like a code snippet of how to actually use it. Uh, it's actually really simple. So basically, you construct this state query object where you have this chain ID, which is the chain you want to get information from. You pass in a block number, uh, which is what block number do you want to use. Uh, you pass in the, the from address, which generally is just zero because it's just the message dot sender of the query, which is usually irrelevant for view functions. You pass in the address that you actually want to call, and then you just pass in the call data. So it's really just simulating an ETH call, uh, or any view function. Uh, and you can see here in particular, we're calling, I believe this is the nouns address with the balance of selector with a message dot sender of the transaction. And then you issue a request to our gateway. So we have a state query gateway. You pass in the state query object, and then you pass in some callback information. So you pass in what function you want in your contract to be called back with the result. And you also pass in any additional context that you want to be passed into the callback. So in this case, it's the user's option of what they're voting. And so this is just a more fleshed out example of L2 voting where it's gated by L1. So the kind of workflow, just to make it really concrete and show how simple it is, uh, in this example, a user would want to vote for an option on L2. And basically, uh, the contract would issue a state query to L1 asking for whether the user has enough of the NFT. Uh, so it issues a state query. And then when that state query is fulfilled, it gets the result. And then it calls continue vote. And you can see if the user's balance is greater than or equal to one, then the vote goes through. Otherwise, it doesn't. So it's really simple to use. And it's kind of it's very nice, because basically now you can just call view functions on arbitrary other chains throughout the context of your contract execution. And to talk a little bit about the protocol architecture. So our protocol architecture is fairly simple. Basically, what we do is we have a contract on mainnet which is a registry that keeps track of all the attesters. So the way it works is when you send a state query to our gateway, we have a network of attesters who listen for that query. They use the ETH call RPC on the relevant chain of the query, and then they get the result using the ETH call RPC method, and they sign the result. So we have this registry source on mainnet that keeps track of all the attesters. And then what we do is on all the other chains, we have a mirror of the mainnet registry that keeps track of all the attesters. And then our state query gateway on each chain uses this registry mirror to understand if enough attesters have signed off on the result. So this is a very simple protocol where if at least 2 thirds of the attesters have signed off on the result, then your result is deemed as valid, and then it executes the callback to your DAP. So it is a very simple architecture, correct? currently, and right now we have a proof of authority updater where we just update the registry source on mainnet to keep track of who all the valid attesters are. And so right now the people running attesters are us and some of our other trusted friends. But one thing that's interesting is actually this architecture uh, for the future can be generalized to not just be very simply attestation based. 
And in particular, we're very interested in using things like Eigenlayer, where you can start providing economic security to back these attestations. So for those of you that are familiar with Eigenlayer, Eigenlayer is this company that's pioneered the concept of restaking, where existing Ethereum validators can restake their ETH and subject it to additional slashing conditions uh, and subscribe to other services and provide security for other services. So in particular, these restaked validators will be calling these ETH call queries and then attesting to the state query requests. And then if they provide the wrong answer, they'll be slashed. And one thing that's really nice is even for optimistic rollups, because they settle after seven days on the L1, you can get the ground truth of such a request after the optimistic rollups have been settled. And so you can actually get economic security with restaking for these queries for L1, but also all the optimistic rollups and all the ZK rollups. And so we're pretty interested in when Eigenlayer comes out. Right now, they're more of a proof of concept. They have some initial deployments, but they don't have their full system working. Basically, augmenting our attestation attestation network with economic security with restaking to have actual economic security backing our attestation and state query protocol. And one interesting thing uh, is for ZK rollups and L1s, we can use some of the concepts behind ZK EVMs to execute the bytecode of our view functions against state roots and provide a ZK proof of these state queries. So one really nice thing about our state queries is that they're really simple. You are able to put in any Solidity view function and get the result on any other chain. So it's very ergonomic for the developer, uh, which is why we released it now, uh, because we think it's a really nice ergonomic API. But then later, once enough people are using it, you could imagine a world in which we take the bytecode of a view function and we're able to run it through a ZK EVM that's read only because a view function does not create or do any of those other opcodes that actually alter the state. And what's really nice is then we can have a succinct proof of your view function execution. And so these are some of the future directions that we're interested in taking our state query protocol and augmenting its security uh, in the future. Cool. That was, uh, I believe, all I have. So thanks. Thank you, Uma. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Uma?